all red, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So I'm Dr. Ed Booth. I am a clinical neuropsychologist uh, here at Huntington. I have a private practice in Pasadena. I also work very, very closely with our lead stroke path doctor here, uh, Dr. Arby Ohanian. Also work closely with Yatha Minazad. Um, Dr. Yagayan, Dr. Chung, Dr. Spitzer as well. We have a great group of wonderful uh, neurologists and practitioners here um, in the um, Huntington area. We're very, very lucky to have such great medical care. And thank you so much, Harvey, and thank you for inviting me to come. And Wanda, I apologize if you've heard some of this before. <laughs> I am looking so forward to it. I will be again. borrowing a lot from a presentation that I did do um, at the hospital through the Senior Care Network uh, a few months back. We'll probably skip through a lot of the first part. Um, I love that terminology, Victor, and if you haven't uh, coined that, uh, Reams, I'll give you credit every time I say that because that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Everyone in here probably has either suffered from or has a loved one that has suffered from a stroke. And um, it's actually, unfortunately, a very, very common uh, neurologic condition and disorder. But we want to see uh, prevention and we want to see more victors. I love that term. Okay? Glad to see you all here. So quickly, if you've never seen a neuropsychologist, let me just tell you what that means. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, but primarily focus on working with individuals who have had um, brain disorders or brain diseases. Um, so I see patients with traumatic brain injury, stroke, multiple sclerosis, brain tumor, everything under the sun that you could imagine. Even medical issues like cardiac disease and diabetes we know can lead to disease of the brain. So my focus is understanding um, how my patients are doing from an adjustment and also from a cognitive perspective. And I'm also engaged in the development of a new rehab program um, in association with Southern California Neurology Consultants. And this is our new rehab program that we've been developing over the course of the last couple of years. And we'll be rolling out more things in the next uh, few uh, months. And I'll tell you guys a little bit about that. I'm originally from Texas. Book of Horns, if anybody's a Horns fan. And um, I studied at University of Texas originally, worked in brain injury rehabilitation in Texas, did a master's at Boston University, um, and that got a little cold up there. Uh, so I went back to working with one of my mentors, Aaron Bigler, who is probably one of the most prolific neuropsychologists with respect to research and publications and uh, studied in Utah for a while with him. And then I came out to uh, UCLA and did my postdoctoral residency at UCLA, and I've been practicing here in Pasadena since about 2006. So here I am, and I love, I love being in the Pasadena area. It's a wonderful community. We have so many bright and active individuals. It's a great place to practice. Uh, quick, quick question, mm -hmm. the word Sequilla, I know. What, what does that mean? What the heck does that mean? It's a, it's a fancy word for symptoms, okay? And it can it can it can indicate cognitive symptoms, motor symptoms, or mood symptoms. It's basically sequilla is kind of like the after effect of a disease state, okay? okay? Sorry, we have a little terminology. I'll attempt to refrain from that. And you guys, please feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask me questions. You can call me Holly too. I'm not that formal of a person. So we can skip through a lot of this. Unfortunately, a lot of you have, have had this incident in your life where you've had a stroke. We really need to get on top of the issue because it's a public health issue. It's the number one, number four cause of death, unfortunately. Every four minutes, a stroke takes place in the United States. Over the last year, though, uh, last 10 years, the death rate has fallen dramatically. We have wonderful new treatments. Um, but it's, th this is a major issue, too, is once we treat an individual with stroke, if you're walking and talking or you have symptoms post-stroke and you get discharged and go into outpatient, unfortunately, even in some individuals, they continue to have quite a bit of debility after they're medically stable post-stroke. And that's when seeing a neuropsychologist and obviously continued neurology follow-up is incredibly important because we want to offset that disability as much as possible as clinicians. 
we all know pretty much a stroke occurs when there's a blood supply to part of the brain is suddenly interrupted, or if there's a, a blood vessel that bursts or spills into the surrounding brain tissue. And brain injury occurs when the brain cells are vulnerable, okay, vulnerable to this blood, or vulnerable to lack of oxygen. And, um, and the primary reason why individuals have stroke is ischemia, where there's an obstruction or a clot. Um, hemorrhagic strokes occur if there's a weakened blood vessel. And sometimes, it's something that we need to talk about with respect to stroke, as well as something called transient ischemic attack, also known as TIA. Okay? If you've had a stroke before, and you continue to potentially have these little, they're kind of like little mini strokes, Again, we need to reduce the occurrence of those over time. I'm going to kind of skip through a lot of these. When we were doing this presentation at the hospital, we talked a lot about the initial signs and symptoms. Does everybody in here feel like they know what those are now? Yes. yes. Okay. Does your family know what those are? Okay. It's all about rapid treatment and response. If you have changes in your vision, if you suddenly have changes in your speech, if you suddenly feel altered from a, excuse me, from a mentation standpoint, just go in. Just go into the ER, okay? Let's, let's get you taken care of quickly. We have to act fast. We're looking for facial droop. We're looking for any weakness in the arms or legs or speech difficulties or if suddenly um, there's changes in alteration in perception. Um, so call quickly. So let's talk a little bit about this, the risk factors. Even if you've had a stroke and you're working directly to reduce the recurrence, we always need a little bit of reminder. Okay? I constantly need reminders in my life about what I need to be doing to improve my lifestyle design, that's what I like to call it my really, really solid health-based practices to reduce stroke. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes are some of the primary contributing factors. If I get a call for an acute neuropsychological evaluation after someone's been stabilized in the hospital, more often than not, these first three are around. Okay, we need to reduce those. Heart disease, really, really want to get that treated, okay? because it leads to stroke recurrence, and it also leads to shrinkage in one of the most important parts of the brain that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, okay? Obviously, we, we kind of hear it all the time, but you know, cigarette smoking, not a great thing for the brain, not a great thing for the body, as is uh, heavy drinking, um, obesity, um, inactivity. We're going to talk a lot today about some of the research with respect to exercise and why that's so important. Obviously, family history of stroke, and as we age, we're all at greater risk, okay? There's a great vascular load to the brain. So I have a pretty picture of my 28-year-old brain. I should have put it in this slide. So my 28-year-old brain looks great. I'll be 47 in January. I guarantee if I compare my 28-year-old brain to my 47-year-old brain, I probably have a little bit of ischemia. Yeah, I probably have a few little blips where I've had a little little micro infarct. One, I have a history of migraines, which I try to control. Okay. But it's just the natural fact that we all tend to have what we call increased vascular load, okay, because the brain is highly, highly vascularized. Um, these are the advanced treatments. Some of you may have gotten a TPA. It's a really aggressive new treatment, which we do here at Huntington. Huntington's a lead stroke center. Um, so we won't go through all these. If you have any, any, any recurrence of symptoms, get, just get to the ER quickly. Dr. Ohanian and his team will take care of you, okay? Um, I know this is something that we, we wanted to talk a lot about, okay? So we have a great stroke center here. Once, once we get people medically stabilized, some, some people in here may have gone to the neurorehabilitation unit uh, with Dr. Hegday and Dr. Berry. Um, some people may have even done some extra treatments at Casa Colina or CNS, some of the other subacute facilities. But um, this is kind of my domain here, is once an individual has a stroke, it's pretty typical that they might get referred to the neurologist and then also to a neuropsychologist. Because there are a number of different <coughs> things which can happen post-stroke. Uh, motor functioning is something that can be... Um, can be negatively impacted. People can develop that paralysis or weakness. 
or simply what we kind of call paresthesias, alterations in sensory functioning, where you might have a have numbness or weakness or tingling. Okay, um, changes in language functioning. This is actually um, can be a common um, symptom or sequela post stroke. Sometimes for individuals, it's just dysarthria. It's a difficulty with the oral motor expression. So our speech therapists help with, with, with the oral motor issues. Other times, there are areas of the brain that control language functioning, which are a little bit more posterior in the brain, and they tend to be a little bit more vulnerable, particularly in left hemispheric stroke. People can develop aphasia. Sorry, there's some little terms here. But aphasia is actually disruption in language. It can be both expressive, meaning an individual has difficulty with the expression of their language. It can also be receptive. People have a hard time understanding what is being said to them. Okay. Praxis uh, is, a, is an, a dis if you have a, a deficit in praxis, it disrupts your ability to engage in purposeful movement. And it's not just a, um, a, a paralysis issue, but if a stroke impacts an area of the brain called the parietal lobe, it can impact an individual's ability to plan motor movements, like how do you brush your teeth. There may be some, in, in, some inability to kind of engage in that motor planning to get the toothbrush up to the mouth. Um, spatial and perceptual changes also can happen commonly. Anybody in here probably have some visual def deficits post-stroke? Sometimes you can have focal deficits, okay? It can change your visual field. But also, sometimes when there's, when there's involvement in the parietal area of the brain, it's the lobe kind of around here, it can, it, it can disrupt um, visual perceptual abilities, our ability to navigate kind of have a spatial map, our ability to process visual information, okay? Um, now, this is probably, this working memory and short-term memory is probably the number one complaint post-stroke, okay? Okay, probably is the number one complaint. Um, and there's a reason why that is, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. Um, this, I know, again, sorry for the terminology. Uh, this may not impact stroke patients as much, but one area that can really cause some difficulty for us as clinicians, clinicians excuse me, is something called anozoonosia. Some neurologists made that up a long time ago. But essentially, there are times when an individual has had a stroke or an injury to the brain particularly if it impacts the frontal areas of the brain, an individual may not be able to fully grasp the intensity of their cognitive impairments post-stroke. And that can present as some challenges to family members and also challenges to patients, particularly when they're early in their recovery curve. Okay? And they may, be, um, they may be overestimate their capacities. Okay? And they might be prone to making a, a judgment, you know, judgment calls that are not quite on target. Okay? This is something that as neuropsychologists we, we actually work a lot with, is how do we improve an individual's awareness of where their cognitive strengths and weaknesses lie so that we can um, help them better adapt to their symptoms post-stroke. In, in, in my terms, uh, I've had people tell me that that you, you just did to to me. They said you, you just did don't realize how bad you were two years ago, mm -hmm. and, and 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 they were right. You know, that I just didn't. Right. I just didn't know. Well, and most people are still operating even after um, even after having an, an initial injury to the brain or initial stroke. Um, you know, their brain is, you know, kind of in a trauma situation, and people are kind of operating as though they're their, their normal selves, and they just don't have the capacity to visualize and fully appreciate. Your brain kind of goes in autopilot to some extent, but the autopilot can lead us to, um, to making, you know, errors in judgment, 
um, sometimes even can impact safe can change. And this is something I don't think was discussed as much many years ago when I first started doing stroke work. We didn't talk much about mood and adjustment issues and behavioral functioning um, post-stroke and psychological functioning. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, the realities are, obviously, it's very difficult to, one, go through a traumatic illness um, first and foremost. So, of course, there are horrific adjustment issues for a patient who might feel vulnerable after having a central nervous system disorder. For their family members, it's scary, you know. I I'm a practitioner. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, but when my mother had a critical neurologic illness, I mean, I was a mess. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult to handle it, even if you're a practitioner and you know you have all the book knowledge. The thing is, though, is the brain is the actual controller of our mood, our emotions, our affect. So we're learning more and more about how actually when people have changes in behavior <coughs> or personality or mood post-stroke, it really is a lot of times neurologically based. My, my uh, uh, neurologist, uh, uh, he, he prefers to use the term traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. rather than illness or, mm -hmm. or whatever. You, mm -hmm. you just use a different mm -hmm. term because mm -hmm. he, 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 I had a, a hemorrhagic stroke. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the bursting of a blood vessel, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that led up to it, but the actual, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was not much different than a football player or a, a, a soldier being hit the side of the head really hard and the blood vessel right. bursts. Right. And, and then they can't walk or they can't ride a bike or can't drive again. And, and then you deal with the psychological effects of that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the post-traumatic stress syndrome mm -hmm. that, that, that only now, only now I'm not meeting in the last couple of years, has the, and I know I'm probably jumping ahead for you, is the, are the psychologists mm -hmm. recognizing that, that stroke it has a lot of the same uh, uh, psychological challenges oh. as a brain injury. Absolutely, because a yeah. stroke is a brain injury. A stroke yeah. is yeah. just another form of an acquired injury to the brain. So I don't, I, you know, we, we kind of talk about the proximate cause, like in TBI, more like, uh, you know, a focal lesion or a closed head injury, but many times at the end of the day, um, if I see a profile of neuropsychological test scores and I don't have any clinical data, there are times when I can't differentiate. Is this a TBI or is this a stroke patient? Because many times um, they can present with very, very similar symptoms. So I think it's just much like a, a lot of other types of closed head injuries. Although, because of the distribution of the blood supply in the brain, patients with stroke can have more focal area of deficit, okay? But really the thing is, is when you have a stroke or you have arteriosclerotic disease or you have AFib that leads to vascular disease of the brain, it's very what we would call heterogeneous in the sense that not one stroke is going to look the same in, in two different people. Even if the lesion location was exactly the same, people's brains are organized somewhat differently. And as, as neuropsychologists, we're looking more and more about how really um, it's more about a disconnection syndrome that develops post-stroke that really can impact how people do from a cognitive perspective. Okay. Um, as, and we don't, uh, we don't focus as much on the lesion model as much. Um, but obviously many of you may have gone through this um, in, in an acute stage, um, done some physical therapies, occupational therapies, and speech therapies, neuropsychological therapies, um, continued physical medicine, rehab, follow-up, nursing care. So typically people stay about two to four weeks uh, back in the uh, late 80s and 90s, we had people staying in rehab for forever, so the days of that are over, unfortunately. Um, so uh, the great news is, here we have all of these 
victors potentially in this room. I love that word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the great thing is, is that the brain has a lot of plasticity, not meaning we're made of plastic, but plasticity meaning the brain is malleable, the brain is responsive, the brain is, uh, is able to readily recover, and in stroke, in the first four to six months is when people demonstrate the greatest trajectory and improvement in symptoms, okay? Now, what's interesting um, is that many times people can recover those functional deficits quicker and motor functioning deficits quicker than cognitive deficits recovery. So for my work, it's not uncommon that I see people, you know, five months post-stroke, eight months, six months, 18 months. You know, I can sometimes continually treat people um, with um, neuropsychological therapies because the neurocognitive profiles can kind of still linger on. There's some people out there, I don't know if they're expecting the room, so we should probably check with that. So what tends to happen is many times in the initial stages of stroke, people are very focused on those severe symptoms of um, difficulties with gait, difficulties with coordination, difficulty with mobility, difficulty with vision, difficulty with articulation. And um, so what happens is uh, many times when people tend to make plateaus of, in their recovery stage, and they're very excited about that level of physical recovery, many times it's at that point that suddenly the cognitive deficits become more readily unmasked. Okay, yeah, it's a city residence meeting at 12. Okay. They need the projector, so. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you want to continue with this and we'll make sure you have a projector for next month? Are you available? We can do that. Is that all right, folks? I'm terribly sorry, you know. Um, we'll make sure that we have everything we need. I'll check with you, Reams, and... and uh, I didn't re remember your name. Daniel. Daniel, to make yeah. sure we have everything. If, if people want to talk here itself, particularly with a lot of comprehensive physical, occupational, and speech therapies, the cognitive deficits, and a lot of times people mean what, ask me, what does cognitive mean? When we talk about cognition, it essentially entails an individual's thinking ability. Um, so as neuropsychologists, we really look at a lot of different domains of thinking. We definitely um, look at how an individual um, is doing with respect to their language functioning, how they can express themselves, how they can understand language. You know, as humans, we're kind of language-bound. Okay? Um, do they understand social cues and nonverbals as well? So we look at core language functioning, that's a part of cognition. Visual spatial processing skills is another important aspect of cognition and thinking. Um, another important factor is speed of information processing. How effective is your brain? How efficient is your brain? How readily can you solve problems? Another very important aspect of cognition is an individual's ability to pay attention in their environment, to take in information, to figure out in kind of a split second what's important and not important to pay attention to, okay? Kind of what we think about is what's salient in our environment. How do we prioritize information and then make decisions based on that attentional component? That's kind of what we call short-term working memory and executive functioning. Those functions have more to do with the frontal areas of the brain. And memory is a huge aspect of cognition and thinking skills. So neuropsychologists are also involved in the understanding and measurement of how our patients are doing after a stroke or injury to the brain and how they're doing with respect to their memory. And lastly, again, as neuropsychologists, another aspect of what we call cognition and behavioral functioning is emotional function, how an individual is doing with respect to their um, emotions and their behaviors. So cognition is a very, very big um, set of things that we look at. 
And that's the problem, is that a lot of times our stroke patients um, come to me two years post-stroke, and they have no idea. They've never seen a neuropsychologist. They don't know. They, they are struggling. They're saying, I can't remember information. I'm feeling depressed, and they have not been referred. So hopefully, we're getting the word out. Um, because the reality is, is, even though we have these wonderful technologies like this tissue, um, you know, plasma injections that we can, that Dr. Rouhani and Minazad, all the neurologists can do, in a, you know, in a, if a person comes to the ER quickly, and that resolves a lot of times the clot and the expression of the stroke. But even in that instance, many times patients can still have cognitive deficits. And so it's sometimes the cognitive deficits, because they're not attended to as much, um, and many times patients are kind of struggling for years after stroke, it's really, it really wreaks a lot of havoc in an individual's life. And I think a lot of my patients that I see, they're doing what they, they've got, they've gotten all their rehab therapies, they're, they're feeling good, they're adjusting to any residual deficits, and they're doing the best that they can um, and sometimes a lot of my patients are kind of trying to fake it till you make it. Yeah, you know, and that's not a bad thing, right? The issue is, is if an individual has had good recovery of a lot of their functions and they're going out into the world um, as if they're fully recovered and they're acting in that fashion, the reality is your loved ones, your colleagues, your friends, people in the community, have the same expectation of you. So you might be met with challenges that you actually, in your brain's just not ready to handle. So by, by kind of having to do the fake it till you make it phenomenon, that can kind of also lead to further adjustment difficulty and depression um, because people don't really understand what their strengths and weaknesses are. And they're putting themselves into situations which which might simply just be a little too overwhelming, okay? and they don't have they don't have the tools to figure out how to compensate, and they don't feel comfortable in expressing what their deficits are because they want to look strong and they want to look like the victor, right? Um, but in my mind, it's the, the having a good neuropsychological evaluation. I'm not trying to drum up business for myself. There are plenty of other good neuropsychologists around too, so. But getting a really good evaluation um, after a stroke is a really excellent way for you and your family and your clinicians to know what areas you need to work on. Because, again, the brain has that malleability, that plasticity. So we want to take advantage of that. We want to improve um, an individual's functioning and their adjustment. So there's one thing that um, we talk about in depression, too, um, that's interesting, after stroke. Um, many times people think depression simply is melancholy, kind of like the depressed poet. You know, um, you know having a melancholic state, your mood is low, you know, you're feeling really down, and life is negative, and... Um, that's not always the case after an individual has had a stroke. People may have a different kind of depression. Have you guys ever heard about a different kind of depression? Does anybody in here feel tired after your stroke? Does anybody in here feel like they just can't think fast enough and move fast enough and it's just hard to get through things? Sometimes. Does anybody see a task and they just go, God, I can't do it. I don't have, and I'm from the South, so I don't have the gumption. Or I don't have the chutzpah. Anybody feel that? Yeah. Okay. That's a kind of depression, actually. And it's called apathy. It's kind of an apathetic depression. People feel sluggish. They can't get through the day. They're fatigued. They don't feel like they can handle things. They'd rather kind of isolate. Well, interestingly enough, is actually some researchers at UCLA were looking at HIV patients. Um, because we do know patients that have HIV, that can impact certain areas of the brain. And they started looking at well, what hair itself, particularly with 
a lot of comprehensive physical, occupational, and speech therapies. The cognitive deficits, and a lot of times people mean what, ask me what does cognitive mean? When we talk about cognition, it essentially entails an individual's thinking ability. Um, so as neuropsychologists, we really look at a lot of different domains of thinking. We definitely um, look at how an individual um, is doing with respect to their language functioning, how they can express themselves, how they can understand language. You know, as humans, we're kind of language bound. Okay? Um, do they understand social cues and nonverbals as well? So we look at core language functioning. That's a part of cognition. Visual spatial processing skills is another important aspect of cognition and thinking. Um, another important factor is speed of information processing. How effective is your brain? How efficient is your brain? How readily can you solve problems? Another very important aspect of cognition is an individual's ability to pay attention in their environment, to take in information, to figure out in kind of a split second what's important and not important to pay attention to, okay? Kind of what we think about is what's salient in our environment. How do we prioritize information and then make decisions based on that attentional component? That's kind of what we call short-term working memory and executive functioning. Okay. Those functions have more to do with the frontal areas of the brain. And memory is a huge aspect of cognition and thinking skills. So neuropsychologists are also involved in the understanding and measurement of how our patients are doing after a stroke or injury to the brain and how they're doing with respect to their memory. And lastly, again, as neuropsychologists, another aspect of what we call cognition and behavioral functioning is emotional functioning, how an individual is doing with respect to their um, emotions and their behaviors. So cognition is a very, very big um, set of things that we look at. And that's the problem, is that a lot of times our stroke patients um, come to me two years post-stroke, and they have no idea. They've never seen a neuropsychologist. They don't know. They, they are struggling. They're saying, I can't remember information. I'm feeling depressed. And they have not been referred. So hopefully, we're getting the word out. Um, because the reality is, is, even though we have these wonderful technologies like this tissue, um, you know, plasma, injections that we can, that Dr. Rouhani and Minnesota, the neurologist, can do, in a, you know, in a, if a person comes to the ER quickly, and that resolves a lot of times the clot and the expression of the stroke, but even in that instance, many times patients can still have cognitive deficits. And so it's sometimes the cognitive deficits, because they're not attended to as much, um, and many times patients are kind of struggling for years after stroke. It's really, it really wreaks a lot of havoc in an individual's life. And I think a lot of my patients that I see, they're doing what they, they've got, they've gotten all their rehab therapies, they're, they're feeling good, they're adjusting to any residual deficits, and they're doing the best that they can. Um, and sometimes a lot of my patients are kind of trying to fake it till you make it. Yeah, you know, and that's not a bad thing, right? The issue is, is if an individual has had good recovery of a lot of their functions and they're going out into the world um, as if they're fully recovered and they're acting in that fashion, the reality is your loved ones, your colleagues, your friends, people in the community have the same expectation of you. So you might be met with challenges that you actually, in your brain's just not ready to handle. So by, by kind of having to do the fake it till you make it phenomenon, that can kind of also lead to further adjustment difficulty and depression um, because people don't really understand what their strengths and weaknesses are. And they're putting themselves into situations which, which might simply just be a little too overwhelming. Okay? And they don't have... They don't have the tools to figure out how to compensate. And they don't feel comfortable in expressing 
what their deficits are because they want to look strong and they want to look like the victor, right? Um, but in my mind, it's the, the having a good neuropsychological evaluation. I'm not trying to drum up business for myself. There are plenty of other good neuropsychologists around too. So, but getting a really good evaluation um, after a stroke is a really excellent way for you and your family and your clinicians to know what areas you need to work on. Because, again, the brain has that malleability, that plasticity. So we want to take advantage of that. We want to improve um, an individual's functioning and their adjustment. So there's one thing that um, we talk about in depression, too, um, that's interesting, after stroke. Um, Many times people think depression simply is melancholy, you know, kind of like the depressed poet. You know? Um, you know, having a melancholic state, your mood is low, you know, you're feeling really down and life is negative. And um, that's not always the case after an individual has had a stroke. People may have a different kind of depression. Have you guys ever heard about a different kind of depression? Does anybody in here feel tired after your stroke? Does anybody in here feel like they just can't think fast enough and move fast enough and it's just hard to get through things? Sometimes. Does anybody see a task and they just go, God, I can't do it. I don't have, and I'm from the South, so I don't have the gumption. Or I don't have the chutzpah. Anybody feel that? Yeah. Okay. That's a kind of depression, actually. And it's called apathy. It's kind of an apathetic depression. People feel sluggish. They can't get through the day. They're fatigued. They don't feel like they can handle things. They'd rather kind of isolate. Well, interestingly enough, it's actually some researchers at UCLA were looking at HIV patients. Um, because we do know patients that have HIV, that can impact certain areas of the brain. And they started looking at, well, ways that come into the neurology wing, they have this kind of different kind of depression. What does that mean? Well, they actually kind of identified that actually when people have more subcortical disease, so the brain is made up of, uh, you know, white matter, which is like the information superhighway, all these long axons. Okay, that help one cell connect to another cell. And then our, then our actual gray matter are actual cells. Okay? And so, so the subcortical areas of the brain are kind of these little tiny structures. They're, they're the thalamus and the, the motor and the motor structures deeper in the brain that are a little bit in, embedded in the cortex. Those are areas that are a little bit more vulnerable in stroke. Somebody in here may have had a basal ganglia stroke. Okay? Okay. Um, or a pons or the thalamic stroke. And also, there are other areas of the brain that, if I can find a pretty little picture, we can kind of pass it around. Even if an individual has cardiac disease or um, has multiple migraines, there are certain areas of the brain right through in here, kind of this is like a brain been cut like this. It's, it's in these long pathways, in the white moderate matter pathways, where we tend to get little infarcts, little blips, okay? So uh, when there's vascular disease, it tends to sometimes impact certain areas of the brain that are more subcortical and, and in these areas, and people tend to have more apathy if they have brain uh, disease in these areas. So it's a, a, the phenomenon of depression post-stroke can sometimes be very, very different than classic depression. And I think that's something that also challenges you know, general clinicians, too, and how do, how do we boost that? And, you know, my thought is first we just educate our patients about what that's like. And also, the last thing in the world I want my patients to do um, is to beat themselves up over something that's actually neurologically based. And there are times when um, I know that our neurologists and neuropsychiatrists can prescribe medications to help boost mood, and that it can be a very, very complex issue. Because there are times when their classic, you know, medications actually may not do the same trick. So, um, because, uh, you know, because they operate differently. So, it's a very complex issue dealing with 
neuropsychological issues, cognitive issues, and mood and behavioral issues post-stroke. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times our patients are not getting the, the service. You know, not that we can, not that neuropsychologists are a panacea, <laughs> um, but I do think that, that neuropsychologists can provide patients with a little bit more information about um, what um, what can happen after stroke. Uh, so we talked a little bit about apathy. Anxiety is another, uh, people can get anxious and regularly in, in the more classically depressed too, um, post-stroke. Um, I want to talk to uh, you guys a little bit about some good news. Yeah. Okay. So um, most of you are probably, any, anybody still doing rehab therapies? Somebody, some people are still doing some outpatient. Good. Yeah. You know, sometimes I always tell people take advantage, you know. I know like every year I think Medicare hits the reset button and you can get more therapies, you know. If you can, just do it, you know. We have a certain number of dollars I think every year that we can utilize. But the reality is, is we can do rehab in the home. Okay. Just because you have uh, utilized all your rehab dollars doesn't mean that you can't develop a home program. And the great news is, 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 bless you, yes, is just like any other form of brain injury or brain disease, stroke actually and recurrence of stroke can be offset by making really aggressive adjustments to your lifestyle design. That's what I like to call it. Okay. So, um, and actually, a majority of, when we talked about those risk factors to stroke, now some people definitely have genetic risk. There may be some individuals that have a genetic risk for stroke. Um, but if we have hypertension, high cholesterol, um, or we're a little bit, um, we're, we're in, in need of losing a few pounds, or we have cardiac disease, guess what? Those are treatable. And not just buy a pill, okay? I don't prescribe anything. Not that I'm anti-medication, but I feel like we need to we need to do a better job of encouraging our patients to take on their rehab um, at home. If you still, after stroke, have these disease states, these H states, if there's hypertension, high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, or diabetes, let's get aggressive about it because those are the, and, and the cardiac disease, those are the huge contributing factors. And we know that it's just like cardiac disease, it's just like brain disease, we have to, we have to fight that with excellent nutrition and exercise. So I'm gonna show you guys this cool picture. Um, the, the most interesting thing is that Again, people complain a lot about memory post-stroke. And they may not have had a specific focal stroke in the memory centers of the brain. But we know that stroke can lead to disconnection. And more often than and not, people that have had stroke have had some of these risk factors of hypertension, high cholesterol, and cardiac disease, and diabetes. So we know that many times in stroke there's already some lack of integrity potentially of the vascular system in the brain. So one of the reasons why memory is so vulnerable is because of where the memory structures are located. So we're a little bit familiar with drought here in California, aren't we? Okay, so uh, this is a tree in a drought situation. Can you guys see that picture? Yeah, okay. What's happening with that tree? Do you see what's happening at the top end of it? Yeah. And so in this drought situation, they've started depriving this tree. You know, I don't know if they're watering every other day or every two days. Their neighbors might be watching them. Um, in any event, <laughs> in any event, they're not watering as often. The tree has become distressed. But isn't that interesting that these little guys all the way up the top are deadening off, okay? So why is that? Why are these little guys more selectively vulnerable? Farther away from the water source. They're farther away from the water source. 